was explained so plan for the day is to prepare some scales to go in for stabilization so that would be um, pre-season wood that's now drawing hasn't um, lost any more weight as I weigh them uh, and you actually sort of like track the removal of moisture from the wood so it gets to a point and it plateaus out it's not going to lose any more moisture in the house so it's seasoned as it is okay so then what you do is you package it up and put it in an oven for overnight hours in order to purge the last little bit wrap it in cellophane put it in the stuff when it's cooled but the cellophane stopped any more moisture from going in because now it's a damp soit dryer and the atmosphere around it and would want to suck up the moisture like a sponge but you've wrapped it in cellophane to stop it so that's the sort of sage mat the only snag is a few need to get cut on the saw to get them prepared to the same size as the rest of them so they're not all stuck up in the funny little bits in the tube that it's going to and then the circular saw and it's full up with blades with six blades problems first world problems they could say but hey so clear the saw off cut the scales to the length of the ones that are a bit too long a bit too big and then put them in the oven for this afternoon see how they go okay right For all those joyful chaps across the pond in the US of A, a lot of your circular saws don't have a crown guard cover, but in the UK we're all a bit safety over the top. So you've got this thing called a crown guard cover, uh, which bolts onto the riving knife. Uh, quite often you'll have a drop down guard on one side, which will be on the side of the workpiece if you've got a fence, and you'll have a duct as well for extraction. It's just a sort of more UK thing. but. Uh, them in the US they just have the blade just stuck out of the thing and you have a, a big uh, piece of wood with two handles on it you can you can run stuff over the top using that clever camera effect as well anyway, anyway but yeah you, you, the Yanks are more aware of the fact that the blade's actually coming out of the bottom of the circular saw sort of body uh, whereas in the UK we've got this thing just to make us aware that there's a blade there apparently With the pieces I'm looking at using, um, I've got two pieces of walnut, which are in, in themselves their own piece. But I can, if I'm shrewd, orientate them that way and that way. So you end up with a bit of, a bit of cream, a bit of walnut, as if there were scales on those sides. Uh, get myself one nice set of scales like that, and then I've got a ferro rod set which I can flip over, and maybe a Kellen set over there which I can flip over. So it's just using them as efficiently as possible. Got a bit of elm burl, um, so I'm going to just cut that in half, and now it's going to be two pair there. Yep, and then this is plum which is now seasoned, really light, uh, but as it's been seasoned in a garden for a couple of years and then in the house it has actually uh, gone not punky but it's on its way so this is definitely in need of stabilization I'm hoping that the colors will come through of the plum quite purpley uh, so these are going to be cut into pairs so sort of 150 and anything else like that I'm just going to keep elsewhere for uh, when I do ferro rods so they're going to 150 sets and uh, off we go. So, mask. And
Straight out of the mini oven, I've shielded these up with cling film. So I've got two bundles like that. Straight out of the oven, straight in the cling film. Too hot to actually handle unless you've got gloves. So they'll now cool for about 10 minutes or so. I'll transition out to the garage and then put them in the um, vessel. And then once they're pretty cool, because you don't want to put them in really hot, because you end up like almost contact curing the uh, infiltrant. And then I'll fill it up with infiltrant and then vacuum it for about six hours sometimes, usually. And then once that's done and there's no more bubbles coming out, uh, then I'll turn off the vac and then you release the vacuum, and then obviously the what was a vacuum to 14 pounds a square inch which is your atmospheric pressure then drives the infiltrant into the gaps that of all the air has come out. And this is why you don't do something like ironwood because one it's, it doesn't really need it and two you you actually leach the really good resins and, and oils out of the wood anyway. Um, so stuff that actually has come out of the wood you would have benefited from if you wanted to put it in to start with. Anyway. Some woods do, some woods don't. See you in a bit. This is the uh, stuff that I'm using. So what I'm going to do is now activate this one. Okay, and, and I'll show you how to put it all in there. Basically, it's nothing really too drastic. We have a to go above the um, level of the retainer this thing here you sort of twist it down this plastic clip and it holds everything down because what happens is when you put the vacuum top on and turn the vacuum on all sorts of weird and wonderful things start happening so I'll just set that up and then we'll turn it on uh, if you're wearing headphones when you are about to turn it on it does get quite loud so obviously yeah Watch the volume in a minute. And not necessarily ensure is my compressor walks, so what we want to do is contain it so it doesn't sort of like fall off the front of the bench. So this is sort of wrapped up in enough stuff at the front so it doesn't walk off the bench. So here's the loudness.
now. This goes back inside. I've left the garage with only the one light and that running. No other lights run. So it's sort of an economy idea. But it's just the way it's all been wired up in here. So when I'm stabilising, the only output I got, like usage, is a little pump and some tubes. No other lights run whilst I'm stabilising. Really sort of wrapping them up. So there'll be one piece there, like that, and then I'll roll. And then another little piece. And then once that's separated from that one, I'll put one there. Sides up, it looks like a nice lunch box. It's just late at night, and I just took these out of the tin foil. So I'm going to be doing the rest and off to bed because I'm up at three in the morning. So basically, ripping it all apart and then peeling these out of the individual tin foil wraps. There's another day. So, the plan for the day is to finish off uh, the rough pieces of wood that have come out of the oven cure for stabilisation. Um, and I did have one, it was like a DM they call it, isn't it on Instagram? A DM. I took a private message on YouTube before they scrapped them, so it's a DM. Um, what is stabilisation? Um, when you get woods that would benefit from being more resilient. Um, so something like uh, spalted wood it ends up getting a little bit fragile when the fungus has gone through it and given it all a lovely black um, sort of ribbony effects of when the, monk, the fungus has gone in and starts drawing the, I think it's the lignin out of the wood. It, it, obviously because it's removing material from the wood it's, it's making it slightly weaker and so that kind of wood initially would be more um, absorbent for something to go into it fluid like an oil but if you put into it an oven cure resin you can actually like finish it off you could then plasticize the wood so it keeps all of the beauty of the grain, of the uh, the effects of the colours going through, but it arrests the loss of integrity of the wood at that point. Wood is basically a series of straws, xylem and phloem. It's tubules that go up and down uh, the main trunk of the tree. And what it's trying to do is passage of stuff up to uh, just service the tree um, whilst having a bit of a draw due to the, the effect of the things are very very thin it's like capillarity and the stoma of the leaves and it's basically a constant draw or siphoning effect going up through the tree so you've got all these micro straws going through and if it's straws then that's why when you get a bucket of water and you put a 4x2 in it it soaks the water up through the, all right if you're going to put a fence post in, you really want to paint the bottom of the fence post. When some woods are treated, quite often they'll wax the two ends of the wood to close the straws up, backwards and forwards through the wood. So it's it's advantageous to sort of seal the wood up on the ends. Well, stabilization does even more than that. It actually gets into the wood sideways as well as end in both ends of the wood 
and it basically just it, it arrests any form of further degradation of the wood. It plasticizes it. But because then it's hard, like hard plastic, you can finish it, sand it, uh, and even buff it, and the the appearance of the wood is 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 gorgeous because it's hard and shiny. So that's why we sort of stabilise the wood. Um, that that's at that stage. But then the other thing to consider is in the future. So let's just say. I put a piece of you, sectioned it down through the middle to end up with scales on the other side, quite thick, put a fibre liner on there, not G10, and epoxied it onto a knife handle. If I didn't oil it and water got into the wood, now that could be over it got wet in the rain or dropped in a, in, a, in a bath of water or a big puddle and didn't get recovered or a sheath got soaking wet and it soaked into the handle the wood can actually swell okay and if it swells to such an extent because it's absorbent it would rather have slightly a little bit of water in it doesn't reject water okay it's hydrophilic you could actually end up with a situation where you've got the metal of the wood like that and the wood, the metal of the blade like this if this was the metal blade and the wood handles are actually swelling you can feel it because it's actually increased its size with the ingress of water now that's swelling you sometimes can split but if you've stabilised it it won't split it okay because it's now plasticized let's just imagine that some wood when you glued it on didn't have all the moisture taken out of it okay and then you took it because you moved to Arizona okay and the heat and the aridity then makes the wood contract slightly so all the bonding of the pins and the fiber liner and the, the, the finish at the top between the blade and the two bits of wood would then slightly recede so it's then drawing back it's losing volume because it hasn't been stabilized okay all these problems are mitigated because you've now impregnated the wood okay with a plastic by using a vacuum pump and then letting it soak okay and then because the plastic is in oven cure you put it in the oven and it's literally just stabilized completely like sorted right um, now some woods I wouldn't go out of my way to stabilize why not Williams um, something like a desert iron wood is that blooming hard anyway okay so you're not going to make it really much more resilient okay but there's some amazing oils in the desert ironwood if you then leach them out by sticking them in a vacuum pump you've actually removed a lot of the sort of creosote sap of you know of what would make the desert ironwood resilient in the first place if that makes sense so some woods you wouldn't bother um, stabilizing because they're already resilient anyway um, and there's a, another school of thinking of when you've oven cured it some grain on some woods is so open and large like an oak that even though you try and finish it you can still see the difference between grain and the stabilization fluid now set so it may not look quite as attractive as if it was a, a another wood so sometimes people myself included um, when it comes to oak if it's a really good oak okay I'll dry it I'll season it dry it bond it to a, a fiber liner put it on the wood and then 
I will soak it in something like either boiled linseed oil or um, Danish oil is another one. That dry dry wood will want to um, suck up the uh, the oil, boiled linseed oil or Danish oil, of which Danish oil has resins in it anyway. Uh, cures not by oven but just air drying um, and that in a, in a way kind of stabilizes it anyway but the finish is far more attractive than a wide grain oak would be if you stabilized it and you still had to every now and again you see in the grain pattern of the wood you see the stabilization white sort of plastic look into it so sometimes some people myself included wouldn't stabilize oak so that's the sort of question that I thought would be a decent idea to sort of answer that DM. Okay, so my thing for today is I'm just going to finish off tidying these up so that now prepped um, by scuffing whichever surface is going to be then accepting a fiber liner or G10 liner. So this would be big dusty, loud. Uh, okay, so, see you in a minute.
so what I've done so far is I've used the belt grinder, which is an exposed belt flying around really fast with nasty teeth on it. And I've removed the sort of dried on glue effect, it looks like glue, of the stabilization fluid. And every now and again you can just see a little bit still on there, but I'm not too worried about it. What I've done is I've removed most of it. Okay. Now I happen to have, in the past, in my job, used something called a planar thicknesser. It's a woodworking tool. It's that grey thing there. Um, simply, it's a rotating drum with blades on it. And a lift-in base that comes up from underneath. As you push it in, some driving gripper things. Grab hold of that, move it forward. It's stuck on the table as it's moving that way. The blade goes around, skims off the um, material as it goes through, and it comes out the other end. Planar thicknesser. So I'm, I, I'm controlling the thickness of the material that's going through. You've got to know what you're doing with them. Um, so, you know, the speed and feed on some of them, you can adjust uh, how much uh, material you're going to move at any one time. Um, sometimes you can actually adjust the planer blade on the inside. So I'm not going to give instructions on how to use it because you'll have to know what you're doing to use them. But because I've got one, I am now going to use my planer thicknesser to turn that finish. Okay, that's sand of the 36 belt. To that finish. Okay. This is a, a characteristic mark of a planar thicknesser. Um, it's, it's when it goes through, it grabs sometimes as a bit of a bit of a rub mark as the, the driver rotor is moving in, and you get these distinguishing marks of oh, that's a planar thicknesser has been done on that. Anyway, so I'm not worried at all about that mark, but you can see that the finish on that is better than that. But it's not the finish I'm after. What I'm after is flat. And each pair, okay, will be done so they've gone through on the same setting. So I've not only evened up, okay, the surface and made it flat, which helps for um, putting the liner material on, it helps flat bonding to the knife handle, but I'm also controlling the thickness. So I end up with an even thickness of scale on both sides, so it helps later on. But when I measure with a vernier, I'm actually putting uniform pieces on to start with. Okay. Now if you're freehanding on the sander, you'll get that flat. When you go around the other side, will you get it flat? Do you understand? It could be slightly out. Generally speaking, knife makers are that good anyway. As long as it's flat and the um, the one surface you're going to put to a liner you go on a lapping plate you've now got it flat that's good the fact that this one could be half a mil longer at one end than another half a mil different from one side to another one end to another and this could be 0.1 mil thicker than that one it doesn't really matter because most knife makers are plenty good enough okay plenty good enough to be able to get a beautiful knife handle that's really even because they can use their hands on a belt sander in order to achieve an even knife handle. But for the sake of the time, and I've got one, removing loads of material on the belt, I'm not putting the blade through too much stress and I get matched pairs which then get taped up and when I pick that up and I've got masking tape on it and it says stabilized elm I know that that's a pair all right so I can pick that up in a year's time a week's time and I know that it's ready to go all I need to do is get a bit of 36 grit scuff up one side the other side's pretty pretty good to finish anyway but it's a match pair and the same thickness is going on each side and they've gone through a machine that's guaranteed that it's parallel thickness that way and that way okay so this is what the machine sounds like um, 
there's basically a rotating drum with blades on there, um, some grabber feeder clawy things at one end, and I'll just whiz it through and I catch it the other side. As I say, you can see me using it, but if you buy one of these things, you'll have to get trained up on it because I'm now not accredited to uh, give instructions. So that's your own risk. Right. Honestly, even though the wood's stabilised, dust. So, here we go. I could vernier these these up now, but that's a pair. Um, when I cut these, I have a standard. I don't cut anything um, from about 130 upwards because what I don't want is a short piece going down and bouncing off of the feed rollers and the friction of the, or at least the contact of the drum with the blades on the end of the piece. So. In my mind, I don't put anything smaller than a 130 through it, so that, that's one of my safety things. But there would be my pair. I then mask and tape. Very simply, stabilize them, stab them, and I can pick that up at any time in the future. So I'll crack on with some more. I'll just start with the thickest piece going. I'll, I'll grab the next sort of thickest pieces and run them through, and gradually, gradually get to the thinner and thinner and thinner pieces. So I don't go up and down, up and down. It's far better on a, on a planer just to go in one direction because when you, when you go up, sometimes there's some slack in the up. People who've used these things know what I'm on about with cheap uh, planer finishers. But I want to start with the thickest bit and get to the thinnest. See that? Um, extractor that goes into that sort of hoodie plenty thing there. Right, so beautiful, even paired pieces of wood. 
okay. Hi, Jackie Boo.